Praise the Lord. It is a blessing to be in the house of the Lord today. And I want to just say to our first time guests that are here, we welcome you and we're glad that you're here with us. Just so you know, the stage is not always decorated this beautiful. And I was sitting there, I cannot see the stage from this angle. And I can't see the whole masterpiece that is before you. But I see another masterpiece. As I look out into this auditorium and this sanctuary, I see the masterpiece of you. You're all looking very beautiful today. And you are the work of God's hands. You are the masterpiece. The church is the masterpiece of Jesus Christ. He worked. He gave his life to create such a beautiful masterpiece. Praise the Lord for that. If you have your Bibles with you, please open to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, we're going to be reading from verse 16. Now, in February of 2023, there was an event that took place in America. It was known as the Osbury Revival. This was taking place in Kentucky at the University of Osbury. And in the month of February, for a couple of weeks, more than 70,000 people came to this university to experience a revival, to get a feel for it, to go through that experience. A year has passed, more than a year. And there was one journalist that, that decided to do a follow-up. What was the result of that revival? So he called the local churches in the area, and he asked them, did your congregants go to this revival? And many of them had. And they asked, did anything change? What changed in your churches? What changed in your people after this revival swept through? And every single church replied, nothing changed. It was interesting to know that there was a Slavic church that was located in that area, and they said, the Slavic church said, we saw a bigger impact from the war in Russia and Ukraine than from the revival that took place. So it begs the question, what happened? Where was that fruit that was supposed to be produced? Where was that fruit that was supposed to remain? The topic of my sermon today is producing fruit that would last. Producing fruit that would remain. What does it take to bear fruit? And not only fruit, but fruit that would last, that would remain, that would continue. What does it take? Look with me. In chapter 15 of John, you have your Bibles open, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. What do we need to do? that our, we would produce fruit just like we see here before us. The land produces fruit. And God is expecting from us that we would produce fruit. We are the work of his hands. We are his masterpiece. And he's expecting fruit from us. And not only fruit, but a fruit that would remain. So I want to share several truths from this passage of how we can produce fruit that would remain. First of all, we must be connected to the source. Must be connected to the source. When Jesus said these words, he was walking with his disciples after the Last Supper. And they were exiting the city. And it is said that as they were getting out of the city to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, they were passing through the vineyards. And he has, as he was walking through these vineyards, in chapter 15, verse 1, Jesus says these words, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me 
that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that he bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. And look in verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You must we must abide in Christ to bear fruit. Those are the words of Jesus. He has given us this condition that for us to produce fruit, just like a branch, can't produce fruit on its own. We can't see and look at a branch and say, oh, look at that branch and how he produced that fruit. You look at an apple tree, you don't say that. You say, look at that apple tree. And Jesus here is saying, look at the vine. The branches cannot produce fruit if they're not going to be on the vine. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Focus on abiding in Christ rather than on bearing fruit. So many times, we try to produce something in of ourselves. And we try to work hard, and we want to try to accomplish something, and we put our energy and effort and we're trying to produce that fruit. And we use so much energy and it's effortless. God says the key to producing fruit is not putting more effort. The key to producing fruit is abiding in Christ. Being connected to the source just like a branch in the mind. And those living juices flow from the vine and they reach the branch and then the fruit is produced. And sometimes we get so caught up in programs, activities, and doing this, and doing that. And we want to accomplish more and more. And then people burn out. Then people say, I can't do it anymore. I have no more strength. And the key is found in being connected to the source, abiding in Christ. We are not the source of the fruit. We are not the source of the fruit. The source of the fruit is the vine. Christ is the source of the fruit. It is what he does through us, and he produces that fruit. Abiding means living. Abiding means having a constant awareness of the presence of God in your life. When the nation of Israel was walking out of Egypt, Moses said, don't lead us out if you don't go with us. If you don't lead us. If you don't abide with us. And God said, my presence will go before you. And God abided with the nation of Israel through the wilderness. It's that presence of God in your life when you walk with God, abiding with him. Enoch, we read in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, Enoch walked with God. He was connected to God, so much so that it says, and he was not, for God took him. For God took him. This person abided with God. He was connected to the source. We have the story of Joseph. And through his life, through the many obstacles that he faced, he was able to bear fruit. How? Where he was beaten, and he's compared to this tree or vine that goes over the wall. How was Joseph able to produce fruit through the circumstances that he was in. He was sold as a slave. He was wronged. He was thrown into prison. He was counted as dead. And yet he was able to produce fruit. So much so that his fruit remained. It continued. It blessed not only his life. 
It blessed the life of his family and generations past till this day. And the nation of Israel is today because Joseph was connected to the vine. Everywhere we read the story of Joseph, it says, and God was with him. He was connected to the vine. Therefore, he was able to endure and overcome those obstacles in his life to produce fruit. And his fruit remained because he was connected to the vine. He was connected with God and God was with him. We do not need to strive and to produce this fruit We need to focus on abiding with Christ. And God will work that in us and through us. And our fruit will be evident and it will remain. So first of all, we need to be connected to the source. Look with me secondly. Look at verse 14 of chapter 15, John chapter 15, verse 14. Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all the things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Secondly, we must be committed to the relationship. Jesus changes the relationship with his disciples. He looks at his disciples and he says, you guys are no longer slaves You are my friends. You are my friends. It's a different type of relationship. A friendship is a reciprocal relationship between two people. And they share a bond of mutual affection. They know and understand each other. They like each other. They have shared interests. They want to spend time together. They help and protect each other. They encourage each other. That is what a friend is. And Jesus calls his disciples into this kind of friendship. And we bear fruit not as a slave, but as a friend. Bearing fruit is doing what God has commanded us. Verse 14, we read, you are my friends if you do what I command you. There was only one other person in the Bible That was called the friend of God. And that was Abraham. We read in James chapter 2 verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which says. And Abraham believed God. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. How do you become a friend of God? Abraham set the example. He believed God. He believed what God said. And you might be sitting here in this service and you might have just came because somebody invited you and you said there was going to be a nice stage there. It's going to be beautiful. And it's a holiday, a harvest festival. But God is not your friend. Because you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior. And Jesus is calling today saying, I don't want you to be slaves. I want you to be my friend. Imagine the God that we just sang about, the one that created the universe, the one that created the angels that sing, holy, holy, holy. This God is calling you into a friendship relationship. He wants to be your friend, not as a slave. We do not serve God because we are slaves. We serve God because he's our friend. And we see here that when a person is a friend, he has a special relationship. And there's something that the friends share with each other. And we read in verse 15, he says, I have called you my friends for all the things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Friends share secrets. In the life of Abraham, God was going to do something. And we read in Genesis chapter 18, verse 17, it says, The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? God asks a question. Abraham is my friend. 
Will I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And God shares with Abraham what he's about to do. And that's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and where Abraham intercedes. And that is the heart of God, to intercede for sinners. When we become friends with God, we start looking more like God. We start looking more like Jesus Christ because he is our friend. Just like Abraham was. And he was able to intercede because that was the heart of God. When we become friends, we know the will of the Father. We know God's will. And many times people ask, how can I know God's will? God is so immense. He's so great. You know, his thoughts are not our thoughts, and he's just above everything. How can I possibly know his will? Become his friend. Have that close relationship with him, and you will know God's will for your life. We read in Romans chapter 12, it says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And hear this, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. When we become friends of God, we know his will for our life. And not only that, our will aligns with God's will. Look in verse 7 of chapter 15. John chapter 15 verse 7. It says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. He repeats that in verse 16. So that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. How is it possible that I can, that Jesus says, whatever you ask, it will be given to you. Whatever you ask. So I could ask whatever I want? No. When you become a friend with God, your will aligns with God's will. And then we don't ask, okay? As James writes, you do not have because you do not ask. But when you do ask, you ask to fulfill your own lustful desires. And you do not receive. And that's why he explains why we have quarrels and fighting and all this, what goes on. Because we ask amiss. We do not ask according to the will of God because we are not connected to the vine. And we're not committed to that friendship relationship with God. We want fruit to be produced in our lives. If we want fruit to remain in our lives, we must be connected to the source And we must be committed to the relationship. Then we are able to produce fruit. But look with me, thirdly, at verse 16, our main passage here. Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. And that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. There's a purpose. Thirdly, we must continue in fulfilling our purpose. God has a purpose. And he begins this word with saying, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And many proponents of unconditional election choose this verse and they say, well, here you go. This verse talks about God choosing people for salvation and they forget about the context of this verse. I want to say that is an error of interpretation in this verse. This is not talking about salvation. This is talking about choosing or election for a purpose. Jesus was talking to his disciples that have believed in his name, that have followed him. And he tells them, I called you. I chose you. When he came up to me, he said, follow me. And they responded in faith following him and he says i appointed you 
Jesus gave them a appointment. And this is like a status, a direction. They were supposed to fulfill. And he says, I appointed you like appointing somebody on a rank. That you would go and bear fruit. That was the purpose. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, we read, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Why? Why are we called that? Why are we called this beautiful masterpiece of God, the work of his hands? Why? And he says, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That we may proclaim his excellencies. The highest duty of man is to glorify God. That is our purpose. Our purpose is not just to look beautiful, not just to have this masterpiece. Our purpose is to glorify God. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. My Father is glorified by this. We bring glory to God when we fulfill our purpose by bearing fruit. Many of you have gardens at home. Many of you grow certain things, and it's great that we are, can do that. Now, my parents also have a garden. And sometimes some fruits and vegetables, they fall over to me. And I get some tomatoes, some cucumbers. That's great. And when I look at that cucumber, I don't thank the cucumber. And I don't start praising the cucumber or the tomato. How beautiful you are, right? And I just start saying, uh, imagine just start saying, you're so red, you're so ripe, it's so delicious. What do I do? I thank my parents. I thank them. I say, wow, you guys had a plentiful, fruitful year. This is amazing. You put so much work for it, and, and, and you produced fruit, and it's amazing. It's just awesome. Thank you so much. When we produce fruit, and when we re realize that it's not us, we are not to be glorified. We are not to be thanked. We are to glorify the Father. He is the one that produced it. He is the gardener. By the way, when we read the creation account, God is revealed as a gardener. So when you're working in your garden next time, you're doing God's work. You're looking more and more like God. It's like God planted a garden in Eden. God plants a garden. He is the gardener. As we read here in chapter 15, my father is the vine dresser. He's the one that does all of this. And we glorify him. We fulfill the purpose of glorifying him. The goal of Salvation Baptist Church is to glorify God. That is why we exist. That is why we have this service. That is why we have this beautiful, amazing choir that sings. That is why we have everything that we do. We want to bring glory to God. We want to glorify God and lift his name, not us. We are just the works of his hand. He produces everything in us and through us. And it is not to us the glory. It is the glory to God. We are appointed with a mission. Jesus appointed that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. One of the greatest blessings of bearing fruit is seeing God work in your life and through your life. It is a joy. And Jesus says this in verse 11 here, these things have I spoken to you so that you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. There is no greater joy to see fruit. When you work in your garden and you look out and that first little fruit came out, you get all excited. Something's producing. I'm doing something right. Something's coming out. 
There's no greater joy to see when a person comes to Christ. To see a believer accept Jesus Christ, knowing that this is what we are called for. Now, if we look at the context of this in verse 17, the fruit that Jesus Christ is talking that we should be producing is that fruit of the spirit of love. Look at verse 17. This I command you. So he appointed them. He said, this is the fruit that you must bear. This I command you that you love one another. That we love one, one another. This I command you. The greatest fruit you can bring is loving another. Jesus Christ, just a little bit before that, in verse 12, he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. That one lay down his life for his friends. That is the greatest fruit we can produce. Loving another and laying our lives down for another. Rejecting ourselves, denying ourselves the comforts, the things that we want in life and saying, I'm going to lay my life for another to serve someone else. John, in 1 John chapter 4, he writes, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Who loves is connected to God. Who loves has a committed relationship with God. And anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. Loving one another is the greatest fruit that we can produce. We're all different here. Not a single person on the planet Earth is the same. But God has loved us just the same. And he calls that to that same love. We are most like God when we fulfill the commandment and we bear the fruit of loving one another. No tree bears fruit for its own benefit. You don't see an tr apple tree consuming the apples that it produces. Fruit is always produced for the enjoyment of another. The fruit is produced so others could benefit. The tree does not benefit from it. But others that see that fruit and partake of that fruit, they are benefited. How can we bring that fruit of love today? Maybe share a meal with someone you don't know. Share the gospel with someone that needs to hear it. Sacrifice your comfort to meet the needs of others. Look out for the interest of others so they could benefit and God would be glorified. Yesterday, we went out door knocking and we met the people in the community. And we knocked on one door and this lady opened up the door. We started sharing with her who we are we introduced ourselves, and she says, I'm not interested. I know all of that. I went to a Bible college, but I reject all of that. I disagree with all that you're saying. And we started talking. We started asking her questions. And it was interesting. Uh, her husband from the living room yells out, we worship the devil. And then he came out and we had a conversation. We stood at their door for more than half an hour talking with them. They came into a stumbling block. They didn't see love. They didn't see the love of God. And he also went to a seminary. He went to a Catholic school. And he was trying to debunk our whole faith and what we believe in. He says, I know the Bible, but I just don't believe it. 
And I don't believe in this God of love that you talk about. He didn't see the love. He didn't see that. And he was bringing me examples of people, of pastors, priests that he knew and what they were doing. And that was a stumbling block. Moody shares an illustration. He says, show me a church where there is love and I will show you a church that is a power in the community. In Chicago, where Moody was preaching, they had a Sunday school. And there was a little boy that came to the Sunday school. And he was consistently coming to that Sunday school. And then the parents moved across town. And when they found out, this boy traveled several miles on foot just to get to the Sunday school. And Moody comes up to this little boy and he says, there are other churches around you could attend Sunday school at. Why do you come here? And the little boy said, because they love a fellow like me here. They love a person like me here. When people come into this building, when the service is going to end and we walk out. And everything that we had and we glorified God and it was great. Well, people come out and say, they love me there. I'm going to go back there because they love someone like me. And that is the greatest fruit we can produce. Continuing and fulfilling our purpose. Now, love demands a sacrifice. Love demands a sacrifice. You cannot love another person without sacrifice. There's a story of a man that received a precious jewel from God. And that jewel was called love. And as he received it, he was so excited about it. And he showed people this precious jewel. And people flocked around him. And people wanted to touch that jewel. And they wanted to see it. And they wanted to come in contact with that jewel. And it started to get dirty from the hands of people. And this person said, well, I received this from God. I'm going to put it in a box. So people don't touch it. So people don't get it dirty. And he put it in a box. And he carried this box around. And when people came up to him and they asked him, what's in the box? He would open up the lid and show him the precious jewel that he received from God. And then he would close it quickly and go on. And people started looking and peeking into that box, so he got a bigger box and locked it up so people won't get into it so nobody would see or touch that jewel. And he carried that jewel with him all his life. When he got to heaven and he stood before God, he opened up that box. And he wanted to show Jesus the precious jewel that he received from him. So Jesus would be impressed that he kept the jewel. But as he opened up the, bo the box, to his horror and amazement, there was nothing left. The jewel deteriorated to ashes. And that jewel of love was wasted. God has given us this jewel of love. We love because he first loved us. And it's not in of ourselves that we are producing this love. It is when we are connected to the vine. We, and we are committed to the relationship with Jesus. And we continue fulfilling our purpose. We are able to express that love to others. And this, the love of God, was made manifest among us. That God sent his only son in the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. How can we bear fruit that lasts? Be connected to the source. Be committed to the relationship. And to continue in fulfilling our purpose. The four, first foreign Baptist missionary from America was Adarim Judson. In the 1800s, God called him to go to a mission field. He was only 24 years old. His wife 
was 23 and they were expecting a child. And he went out to Burma, a city or a country that was not reached. Now, it's interesting, as I read his biography, he went out not as a Baptist missionary. He was going to William Carey, who was a Baptist missionary in India. And he started reading about these Baptists because he believed in infant baptism. And as, as he was traveling on the ship to Burma, he converted. And he believed that you need to have believer's baptism by immersion. And as he came to India, first thing he did was get baptized there. And the churches that sent him out, they canceled his support. They said, we will not. We will not support a Baptist missionary. So he's in a different country, 24 years old, with a new wife that is expecting, and he has no support. And there hasn't been any missionaries in Burma. And this man labored in Burma. And I won't retell his whole story, but he lost his wife. He buried his second wife. He buried seven children on the mission field. At one moment in his life, he isolated himself after the passing of his first wife. He built a hut in the, in the jungles and lived for 40 days by himself. He even dug a grave for himself. And he said these words during that time. God is to me the great unknown. I believe in him but I find him not. But he continued to believe in God. He continued being connected to the source, being committed to that relationship. After six years of laboring in that country of Burma, he saw his first con convert, first person he baptized. He spent more than 33 years in this country, given his life. He died on his last trip from America to Burma on the ship. And you think, what fruit did he produce? Today in Burma, there's a Baptist convention of up to 3,700 churches, more than 600,000 members, and in around 2 million affiliates from just one man. A man that was connected to God. A man that was committed to that relationship. A man that continued to fulfill his purpose to what God has called him. And he produced fruit, and that fruit still remains till this day. Are we producing fruit? Are we producing fruit that remains, that will last? Today, I want to call all of us to pray. And maybe some of us need to get connected to the source. We've never accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. And we need to get that connection back. And you can do that today. Maybe, may, maybe some of you have a broken relationship with Jesus Christ. And you're not fully committed to that relationship with Jesus. Maybe some of us have forgot our purpose and our calling. And what God has appointed us to do. That we would go and bear much fruit. Я хочу призвать нас сейчас помолиться. Будем молиться о том, чтобы мы могли пребывать во Христе. Точно так же, как лоза и ветви, что эти ветви не могут приносить плод, не будущий привязанный к лозе. Они должны быть на лозе, чтобы приносить плод. Будем молиться о том, чтобы наши отношения с Богом были, с Иисусом Христом, чтобы у нас были верные отношения со Христом, чтобы мы были committed, верны Ему в этих дружеских, как он сказал, я называю вас друзьями. И чтобы мы знали нашу цель, для чего мы живем здесь, для чего Бог нас спас, 
для чего Он нас сделал такими шедевр, чтобы мы могли идти и приносить плод. Аминь.